So this is lecture 5 in the course Principles of Metabolism, and in this lecture we'll look at metabolic networks and metabolic fluxes. So what are fluxes and, and why are they important? Well, in metabolism, the behavior of the cell in terms of synthesizing things is, the, is really the key phenotype we're looking for. And in metabolism, fluxes is the way to, to measure this. So it's kind of different from perhaps what we normally measure in cell biology. We usually measure amounts of things. Uh, you might measure mutations in a DNA sequence things. You might measure amounts of RNA with a RT-PCR, say, uh, or you might measure amounts uh, of an enzyme uh, with, with a Western blot or perhaps a phosphorylated enzyme, something like that. Uh, but in metabolism, we're usually interested in looking at the activities of an enzyme. So that means measuring not the amounts of metabolites, but the rate at which one metabolite is being converted into another. So these rates are the metabolic fluxes. And, and this is really a cell's metabolic phenotype. But it um, creates some problems because measuring rates and fluxes is really not that easy. So how do we do this? So first, a, a bit more careful definition of a flux. What, what is a flux really? So we say that a flux is, through a reaction, uh, is the amount of substance that the reaction processes per unit time. So typically, uh, for cellular metabolism, we use units like femtomolar amounts per cell and hour, uh, but it's some kind of uh, measure of amount per unit time. Uh, just to be clear, we also standardize this by stoichiometry coefficients. So if you have a reaction like the one shown in this picture, where you have different stoichiometry coefficients uh, for different components of the reaction, uh, we must take that into account. So what we mean by the flux, which we often denote with V, uh, is the production, the rate of production uh, of a metabolite that has a sto stoichiometry coefficient 1. Uh, so that would, this metabolite, for example, we would produce at 3 times the rate, uh, and this substrate would be consumed uh, at 2 times the rate. So we will have to uh, account for that. But we standardize these, these things so that flux is always well defined. Normally we express fluxes by per cell, uh, or we can express it uh, by biomass, so per total protein in the culture you have. So it, it depends a bit, of course, uh, on uh, experimental conditions, what kind of, of measures you have and what you're able to, to normalize to. But there are a couple of more complications here. Um, so most metabolic reactions are reversible to some extent, meaning that they occur in both directions. There is an ongoing synthesis uh, of the product from the substrate, but the reverse also happens at the same time. So here's an example of a reaction where we have a substrate A which is being, uh, from which we produce a product B in a reaction. Uh, and in this direction, which we call forward, there is a forward flux. Uh, but there's also a bit of flux in the reverse direction. So this means that if you look at the net rate of production of B, it's going to be a net flux, which is the difference between the forward and the reverse. So there's a bit more forward, so the net flux is going to be in this direction. We're going to produce B. But there's also this type of, you could say, circling flux, a circulating uh, sort of back and forth ping pong type of flux. Uh, this is called the exchange flux, uh, and this is the amount of material that you can say is going back and forth between the two metabolites. So these different fluxes are important to distinguish between because sometimes we are able to measure only a net flux, and sometimes we are able to measure only uh, the forward or the reverse flux, uh, but not the, the net flux. And sometimes we are able to see the exchange change fluxes as well. Depends on, on which methods we have for measurement. So we'll get to that. But this is important to keep in mind. So um, a couple of situations can occur. Sometimes we do have irreversible reactions. And then we will be in a situation that a reverse flux is zero. And therefore the exchange flux is also zero. Sometimes we will have reactions which are close to equilibrium. Which means that there is as much flux going in both forward and reverse directions. Uh, 
which means that in such cases the net flux will be zero. But usually we, we have a situation that looks like this one at the top. So how then do we measure fluxes? So one common type of data you see in the literature is the measurement of pool sizes. So you measure the intracellular concentration of a metabolite. And um, you often see that uh, people argue that if pool sizes changes, then the fluxes must change. And usually it is an indication uh, that something has happened in the vicinity of that metabolite. But it's not so easy actually to draw direct conclusions about fluxes from this. So let's consider a scenario that you are doing an experiment, uh, you have treated cells somehow, and you are measuring an intercellular concentration, a pool size, before and after the treatment. And for an interesting metabolite, the pool size goes down by half, 50%. So what could be the change in flux? Well, you can think of two scenarios at least. Uh, one possibility is that there is decreased synthesis of this metabolite. Therefore, uh, the pool has shrunk. So you have a situation where you, this is a kinetic uh, sort of phenomenon. First, you have a, a kind of block upstream, the pool shrinks, and then the system settles at the new steady state and the flux is smaller. But you can also think of the scenario where you actually have an increased utilization of the metabolite. So there's more demand and therefore the pool goes down initially and then the system settles at the new steady state and you actually have an increased flux and a smaller pool size. So it's actually hard to tell conclusively one way or the other. So we should be careful when trying to draw inferences about fluxes from pool sizes. On top of this, it's of course also the, the fact that most metabolites connect to many reactions. There are a large number of enzymes that might produce or, or consume the metabolite. And this, of course, makes it very difficult to say which one has changed when the metabolite is changed. So this is not uh, a great uh, measure to be able to determine fluxes. So one type of flux that we actually can uh, determine from measuring amounts is boundary fluxes. So this would be the uptake of metabolites and nutrients uh, into the cell. Uh, and the release uh, of end products. It could also be the accumulation of an end product. You might have something that accumulates in biomass, for example, the production of a, of a structural lipid or something like that. Uh, so in this situa situation, it's fine to uh, measure the amount of a metabolite uh, as it accumulates over time. And this we can do with a number of methods, so this is, this is not so, so difficult. So this is a kind of a favorable case. Um, and I'm showing here uh, an example of some data from cell lines with uh, uptake of a number of, 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 of nutrients for the cells, uh, so glucose and amino acids mainly, uh, and then also release of some, some byproducts from the cells. And this can be quantified. Um, and you see in this plot that uh, often the, the uh, amounts of things range over a couple of orders of magnitude on both the consumption and release side. So this is data from a paper from 2012. So this type of flux is readily measurable. But what about fluxes inside the cell? So here's where we turn to metabolic networks and uh, what's called a model-based analysis. So this technique called flux balance analysis, where you have a model uh, of a metabolic system, a network that you're interested in, and you consider this system to be at steady state, meaning that there is no buildup uh, over of metabolites inside the cell uh, over time, and the fluxes are constant over time. So here's an example network, uh, the urea cycle. Uh, and so in this case, you can imagine that we might be able to measure uh, some components that come in or exit from this system. You might be able to measure the uptake of, a, of an amino acid or the release of arginine or something like that. And then just looking at this picture, you might intuitively think that we should be able to do some calculations and figure out a few of the fluxes inside the cell if we know some of the boundary fluxes that come in and, and go out. And that's exactly what the flux balance analysis method does. So basically what we do is we represent this network, this uh, metabolic network, uh, 
uh, in a kind of mathematical form uh, using what is called, called the stoichiometry matrix. And all this is it's that we collect the stoichiometry coefficients for each reaction in a table. So for example, for uh, citrulline here, uh, we see that it's, this metabolite is produced by the reaction called OTC. So there's a plus one for OTC. Uh, the, the metabolite is consumed uh, by the reaction called arginine succinate synthase. So there's a minus one there for consumption. Uh, and there's also production of this inside the cell uh, from uptake of it. So uptake of this is viewed as, uh, as production. Uh, and so then for, for citrulline, for example, uh, we have an, uh, an equation like this at steady state. So at steady state, there can be no buildup of the metabolite citrulline. And therefore, whatever the fluxes are through these reactions, neighboring citrulline, they must sum to zero. So that basically expresses the fact uh, that the total synthesis and the total consumption must be zero if you add it up. So that's pretty much the flux balance analysis method. We use the fact that at steady state, the mass balance must be zero. Uh, and then we get these type of equations uh, that fluxes must add up uh, in a particular way. Uh, and then if we have irreversible reactions, we also have a constraint uh, that some uh, fluxes must be positive. So in this case, we are looking at net fluxes uh, throughout. So using this, you can imagine that if we have some partial data on uptake and release, uh, we can be able uh, to infer some other fluxes. And we will look at this in more detail in a computer lab, where we will look not at the urea cycle, but at the pentose phosphate pathway using these methods, and we will see how it, how it can be used. So flux balance analysis has been used quite a lot to try to infer some fluxes in metabolic models, and it's been used in very large uh, settings. So there are these metabolic network reconstructions. Uh, they are, these are large sort of community organized projects that have been organized to gather all the data we have uh, on the, all the metabolic reactions for a given organism. And that gives you huge metabolic networks. Uh, this is an, a table from a, a recent paper uh, by a group at UCSD, uh, which with, they, they organized one of these community projects uh, to really sort of curate everything that they could get their hands on uh, about human metabolism. And they, they built a, a model uh, of, of human cellular metabolism called Recon2. And as you can see, this is up to the scale where we have thousands of reactions and metabolites. Uh, and these are also compartmentalized into various organelles and so on. And so from these databases, you can pull out certain models for particular subsystems you're interested in uh, and so on, uh, and do this flux analysis exercises. Uh, one database we're using a lot in the course is this human uh, psych database. <clears throat> and this is also one of these repositories. So you can view this also as a metabolic network. And you can download data from this uh, to do metabolic flux analysis. So a couple of examples of what has been done on this in the literature. Uh, one early application in this was studying fluxes in organisms that are thought to grow optimally. So they're trying to optimize their biomass growth. And this has been studied a lot in bacteria, in bioproduction settings, uh, in, in, the, in chemostats and things like that. Uh, and under these conditions, the flux balance analysis methods have been fairly successful at being able to identify fluxes, knowing only a few parameters of nutrient uptake, and in this case, the production of biomass. So that's a common application for these systems. There are also more qualitative type of applications for flux analysis. So this is one example from 2009 in a paper where the authors tried to identify biomarkers for genetic disorders using these models. And so what you can do then is you can sort of computationally you can explore setting one reaction to zero, modeling the loss of an enzyme by a by a genetic mutation. And then you can ask, what will happen to the model? Will it tend to overproduce some metabolite? And if it does, maybe that metabolite will accumulate in an organism or in the blood of a patient. Uh, 
uh, and, and become a biomarker. Uh, and so this figure shows some examples of, of predicted biomarkers. And some of them actually overlap well with, with the known biomarkers uh, from uh, genetic databases. So that's a more qualitative uh, type of, of use of, of flux balance analysis. Another example of this uh, is what's known as synthetic lethality. This is an interesting concept where if you consider one enzyme to be lost in a cell, perhaps by a mutation, then you can ask what other reactions are now required for the organism to produce biomass or to produce a, a particular metabolite. So this is called synthetic lethality. So the loss of, of one enzyme sort of creates the lethality of another. <clears throat> and this was studied uh, in one paper from 2011 uh, in, in, in cancer metabolism. And the authors did, I, I think, a fairly clever analysis where they looked at sp specific cancer types which were known to have certain enzymes deleted from genetic mutations. And then they asked what other reactions are synthetic lethal with these and what drugs would target those enzymes. So they came up with an analysis where you could predict drugs that should kill uh, cancer cells from those particular type of tumors. So these kind of, of um, qualitative analysis has been, has been done a lot with flux balance analysis, and there are large models available for it. Uh, we'll do a bit more quantitative uh, analysis with flux balance analysis in the computer lab. Uh, I would say that in most cases, uh, this is not so easy to do. Only having a few uptake and release fluxes usually doesn't constrain the solutions enough. You don't have enough information to learn everything you want about fluxes, and usually there's a lot of uncertainty left. Uh, but in some cases, it can be interesting and, and useful to understand pathways. So more about this in the computation lab.